Well, if I could get your attention, you all want to come on in. We're going to get started uh, this morning. Kind of a unique situation with us. For the next nine weeks, all of our adult classes will start in here, and we've got a video introduction. So for the next nine weeks, some of you are going to have to adjust your, uh, you're going to have to adjust your uh, schedules because Sunday school will start promptly, starting today. Well, we're not very prompt today. Starting next week, we're going to be going at 9 o'clock. Um, these videos are about 12 to 15 minutes long a piece, and um, we'll have an introductory video in here. And then when the videos are done, those of you who attend other classes, just go ahead and go to your, go to your uh, uh, class. And it's the same lesson being taught everywhere, like normal, but we really only had one place where we could show the video because uh, we only have one DVD. So uh, we thought we'd start in here, and so when we get done, then uh, when the video's over, just be dismissed to your class. All right, Pilgrim's Progress, uh, this is the pictures from, and it's going to be a great, it's going to be a great series. I, I hope it'll be an encouragement to you. Um, some have asked if we're going to be providing the book. Um, years ago, we ordered a bunch of books and then just sold them. Uh, now, for now, let's just leave it up to you. If you'd like to get, and I would recommend you get a copy of uh, Pilgrim's Progress and be reading it as we go through. Um, there's two versions you can get. You can get the classic version or you can get the modern day language version. For Terry and I, we ordered one of each to have them both in our home. And so um, if you'd like to do that, maybe uh, you can get it fairly quickly. We got ours two days after we ordered them. And so it'll get here quick. But I, I, I think every Christian ought to have a copy of that book and read it. Um, and I think it'll be an encouragement to you. So no further delay here, Josh. Let's go ahead and start that video, sir. In the year 1676, a poor tinker named John Bunyan was imprisoned in Bedford Jail. While he was there, he started to write one of the most famous books in the English language. And everything is told as if it happened in a dream. I dreamed, he says, that I saw a man with a book in his hand and a great burden on his back. As he read the book, he began to weep. Then, in a lamentable voice, he cried out, What shall I do to be saved? For he lived in the city of destruction which he learnt from his book was doomed to be burnt with fire from heaven and everyone who lived there would perish in the flames. So Christian, for that was his name, went home to talk to his wife and children. Oh my dear wife, he said, and you, the children of my loins, I've tried to keep this from you as long as I could. But it says in this book, we shall all come to ruin, unless we find a way of escape. They thought some kind of madness had got into the poor man. And as it was drawing towards night, they hoped that sleep might settle his brains. And with all haste, they put him to bed. But the night was to him as troublesome as the day. So, when morning was come, and they asked him how he was, he told them, worse, worse. His children were bewildered, his relatives incensed. They tried chiding him and deriding him. Finally, they thought it best to take no notice. So, Christian went by himself into the fields, still reading his book, and carrying his burden. 
No one would listen to his warning, and he didn't know where to turn. Then, in the distance, he saw a man approaching. His name was Evangelist, and he greeted him kindly. Hmm, what are you weeping for? he asked. Sir, he answered, this book in my hand tells me to flee from the wrath to come. Also, I need to get rid of this burden, which is on my back. I fear that it will sink me lower than the grave. Then Evangelist pointed with his finger across the plain. Do you see yonder wicket gate? He asked. No, said Christian. Then do you see a shining light? He said, I think I do. Then said Evangelist, keep that light in your eye and go in that direction. So you shall reach the gate. Then, when you knock, you'll be told what to do. Without delay, Christian began to run. His wife and children saw him running. They wondered, was he gone for good? And called after him to return. The neighbors also came out to see him run. And two of them resolved to bring him back by force. Soon, they overtook him. The name of the one was Obstinate. The name of the other was Pliable. And at first, Christian tried to persuade them to go along with him. What? said Obstinate. And leave our friends and our comforts behind us? Yes, said Christian. For I am going to a kingdom where we shall live forever. Read of it, if you will, in my book. Tush, said Obstinate. <laughs> Away with your book. Hey, will you go back with us or no? No, not I, said Christian. Then said Pliable, If what Christian says is true, I intend to go with this good man. For myself, said Obstinate, I will be no companion to such fantastical fellows. I'll go back to my own house. So they parted. Obstinate went back, and Christian and Pliable went on over the plain. Tell me more, said Pliable, about the place to which we're going. There are crowns of glory to be given us, said Christian, and garments shining like the sun. And he who owns that place will wipe away all tears from our eyes. Oh, oh, come then, my good companion, let us hurry, said Pliable. I can't go any faster, said Christian. I've got this heavy burden. As they were talking together, they had drawn near to a miry slough, which was called the Slough of Despond. It was a place where many travellers before them had been drowned. And not looking where they were going, they both suddenly fell into the bog. Here they wallowed, grievously bedaubed with filth and scum. Nor did the weight of Christian's burden help him. Indeed, he was sinking fast. Pliable, being unburdened, managed in the end to scramble back. But he was very angry. Is this the happiness you promised me? He asked. If we have such trouble at the start, what may we expect at the finish? And he ran off home for a hot bath, leaving Christian to struggle on his own. He had quite given himself up for lost when he heard someone shouting to him from the further side. Oh! His name was Help. 
He told him there were stepping stones just below the surface of the mud and he directed him to them. You see, that's the hazard of this place, he said. It so spews out its filth that at the changes of the weather, these steps are hardly seen. So Help gave him his hand and drew him out and set him upon firm ground again. And Christian continued on his way towards the wicket gate. Although he didn't know it, more trouble awaited him. <laughs> For a certain Mr. Worldly Wiseman was the next to meet him. A very inquisitive and self-important gentleman who dwelt in the town of Carnal Policy, hard by where Christian lived. Hmm. You don't mind my asking, he said. Have you a wife and children? Why, yes, replied Christian. But I'm so laden with this burden that I, I can't take pleasure in them anymore. Who counseled you to start on this journey? A stranger called Evangelist. Ah, I thought so. There's no one more dangerous. He's always misleading travelers. I'm older than you. Let me give you some advice, my good fellow. In yonder village, there dwells a gentleman whose name is Legality. A very judicious man, a man of very good name. He has skill to help men off with their burdens. He has, to my knowledge, cured several who were going out of their wits because of them. Moreover, there are houses standing empty in the village at reasonable rents. The food is cheap and good, and you can send for your wife and children and all live happily together. Christian was, I fear, all too ready to listen to this Mr. Worldly Wiseman, who now proceeded most courteously to direct him away from his right road. Oh, do you see yonder hill? Yes, very well. By that hill you must go, and the first house you come to is Mr. Legality's. Christian shouldn't have listened to him, for what he had failed to tell him was that the hill ahead was a fearsome mountain. It towered above him, as if about to crush him. Worse than that, there were flashes of fire coming out of it. And Christian, because of his burden, might easily have fallen, and thus early on his journey have been burnt to death, wherefore he did sweat and quake for fear. At that moment, who should appear but Evangelist, with a severe and dreadful countenance. Aren't you the man I found weeping outside the city of destruction? Yes, dear sir, I am the man, said Christian, blushing for shame. And didn't I direct you to the little wicked gate? Yes, dear sir. How then is it that you've so quickly turned aside? When Christian had told his story, Evangelist said, you have rejected the word of God for the advice of Mr. Worldly Wiseman. But Mr. Legality cannot free you of your burden. Mr. Legality is a cheat. As he spoke, there was a great clap of thunder. And Christian called himself a thousand fools for listening to Mr. Worldly Wiseman. He turned back in haste and went like one who all the while was treading on forbidden ground. He couldn't wait to regain the road he had abandoned. 
but would he ever reach it? He wasn't at all sure. For narrow is the gate, it says in his book, and few are they who find it. Next time, we shall tell of Christian's strange visit to the interpreter's house. And learn whether or not he discovers a way of ridding himself of his burden. take just a minute or two and let everybody get back to their uh, classes to finish this. We'll start just in about three minutes, maybe four. Well, we can go ahead and get started. Let me, uh, I do want to lift up just for a pause our mission and area of the week, which are our own John and Nick and Nicole Yingling, uh, good co-workers there at the Baptist International Outreach. John served two, two terms in American Samoa. He uh, worked in bio after that under Dr. Vic and Dr. Dykes, and after their homegoing and resignation, he's been president of bio since January 1st, 2017. John and Nicole, the dynamic duo, have been together professionally for many years, uh, serving in the missionary office. Nicole's worked there, it says, 140, no, 14 years. This is wonderful. She's been there forever. We love our missionaries. We love those who are members of our church. We especially, this is the summa cum magna, uh, we love those who are members of our church and serve at bio. That's very important people. Well, the year was uh, 1628 when John Bunyan was born. He lived to uh, 60 years old, 1688, and you heard him say that in the 1870s he was twice in Bedford Jail for refusing to preach with the license. He had been on the wrong side of a war. There's a war in Washington now. It's nothing compared to the war that was going on in England in the 1640s. Charles I ended up being beheaded by Oliver Cromwell and the Parliament the monarchy fell, and for 10 years, uh, England was a republic. John Bunyan fought on the side of Cromwell. They lost, and not only they, but all the godly Bible-believing preachers were taken without uh, their pulpits and taken uh, from their jobs and put out into the fields and were basically an accursed bunch, and the, and the rules got tighter and tighter, and Bunyan, who was a Baptist preacher, ended up in Bedford jail. And there he didn't waste his time. He studied and studied. And the second time he was there, he worked through this allegory of the Christian life, which is so famous. Uh, it's a new series that we're going to do every week for nine weeks about Pilgrim's Progress. And it's a road trip. You remember the first time you figured out the Lord of the Rings was a road trip. They started there with their birthday party and in the Shire and ended up with just about getting killed by dragons and uh, evil creatures. Well, this is a true uh, road trip, and it's uh, given in the similitude of a dream. Uh, Spurgeon uh, wrote these nine uh, uh, sermon series, and you can get those, I checked on Amazon, uh, for about $6.99, and there's all sorts of versions of Pilgrim's Progress. But as Mark mentioned, until very recently, this was probably the second most read Bible, being the first, 
uh, book in the Christian world. It has a lot of influence in the daily thought and the speech patterns of a lot of the English-speaking Christians, and it had a tremendous impact on one of the greatest preachers that ever lived, Charles Haddon Spurgeon. He estimated to have read it 100 times. I might have read my wife's cookbook 100 times, but very few things get my attention enough for 100 times. Here's a sample of the introduction from Pictures to Pilgrim's Progress, which was written by Spurgeon's son, Thomas. He had twin sons, Charles and Thomas. And Thomas served as pastor of the Metropolitan Tabernacle Church about 10 years after Spurgeon died. And writing in 1903, he says, it's easy to see that the commentator, my father, is in sympathy with his author, uh, Bunyan, and that he loves his task. If Mr. Spurgeon were ever prevailed upon to fill up a page of the once popular confession albums, I'm pretty sure his answer to the query, who was your favorite author, would have been John Bunyan. He's spoken of him over and over as my great favorite and has left it on record that he had read Pilgrim's Progress at least a hundred times. The reason for his liking is not far to seek. They both love the book of books. Urging an earnest study of the scriptures, Spurgeon once said, oh, that you and I might get into the very heart of the word of God and get that word into ourself. As I've seen the silkworm eat into the leaf and consume it, so ought we to do with the word of God, not crawl over its surface, but eat it right into it until we have taken it into our innermost parts. It's idle merely to let the eye glance over the words or to recollect poetical expressions or historic fact, but it's blessed to eat into the very soul of the Bible until at last you come to talk in spiritual language. Can you imagine in America and Washington if they substituted Bible words for euphemisms and woke nonsense? And your very style is fashioned upon scripture models. And what is best, your spirit is flavored with the uh, words of the Lord. I would quote John Bunyan as an instance of what I mean. Read anything of him and it's almost like reading the Bible itself. He had read it till his soul was saturated with scripture and though his uh, writings are charmingly full of poetry, yet cannot give us his pilgrim's progress, the sweetest of all prose, without continually making us feel this man is the living Bible. Uh, prick him anywhere, and his blood flows biblene. The very essence of the Bible flows through him. He cannot speak without quoting a text, for his very soul is full of the word of God. I commend his example to you, beloved. Now that's Spurgeon's son giving us an accurate view of that. If you give me something to read and tell me that you highly think of it, I will read it. I will do my best to read it because I trust you and we all are on the same page here in this church. But if one of these great preachers said that, that's something we don't need to die without having to taste it. So, well, you've seen the story. He dwells in a town, might have been called Detroit or Chicago or Memphis, but from the side of heaven, it's the city of destruction. It's the city of death. Uh, did you notice the outline of the story? All set forth in the form and fashion of a dream. And the first thing this man Christian accurately sees is that he now, unlike what Mr. Pliable says or Mr. Legality or the town of morality or any of these people, they dwell and you and I dwell in the city of destruction. Uh, is that not true? It is true. In Adam, all die. I retired from the, being the medical examiner uh, six and a half years ago now. We, I was talking to Dr. Holland, who's taken my place, and he, we have a lot of fun, and he said, how long has that been? I said, well, I know probably a thousand times on ultimate cause of death, I wish I could write Romans 5.12. For as by one man sin entered the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all, for all have sinned. Same thing with Romans 3.10, there's none righteous, no, not one and that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, that's universally true in the city and the world of destruction that we live in. But you don't see that until the Spirit of God, who was working on poor Christian there, started working on me in October of 85. I had a terrible summer of 1985. I had married the most beautiful girl in the world in April of, two, of 1985 and then fell into almost depression, which is not me at all. It was God's conviction that I, something was wrong, and it was me. It was not her, of course. She's wonderful. But I, I, I thought, something is wrong with me. And at the same time, God led me to the 
to the introduction to the Bible, the Thursday men's Bible studies that they had down there at Bellevue that Dr. Rogers taught for 25 years. Same thing exactly. I was being crushed by conviction, but there was hope because there was a book that he said was a word from heaven. And a year before that, I would have thought that was a joke, and he would have too. But it wasn't. It was real. It was a word from God. Number one, this man, Christian, was found by the Spirit of God and un unveiled by the Spirit of God to be a, city, a, a, a citizen of the city of destruction. God granted graciously awareness to this Christian. That happened to me too. I, you may have had this happen as a child. Uh, we're all in different degrees. But this Christian had a book, the book in his hand, and a burden on his back. The Bible both has the condemnation of the ruined race of Adam and the only hope of the ruined race of Adam. And your acceptance of it, me not growing up in a Christian home, is really a supernatural event. The Holy Spirit is unstopping plugged ears. It's uncrusting crested eyes. It is uh, showing you things that you never would have known and never would have understood and give you the strange belief that it's true. I remember that was, I was a third year medical student, very scientific and analytical, and God said, that's just wonderful. We're all glad to hear that. Now, this is true, what I just told you. I said, well, we need to analyze this. You can do that later. You are in the mode of destruction. You need to, to hear a true word from me, and this is a true word from heaven. And the strange thing was, was in my mind, I thought, this is a true word from heaven. And it was, I knew it. I knew it better than I know my name. The burden on my back was now apparent to me. It's on the back of every uh, child of Adam and child of Eve. It's the crushing weight of sin of which by the conviction of the Holy Spirit, I became aware, you became aware, and poor Christian became aware. So we find him with a book in his hand and a great burden on his back. At some point in your life, you've had that to some degree to come to Christ as you have, and I did too. And he says in the field, uh, in the book of Acts, you know, 16, what shall I do to be saved? And then when I started worrying about that, again, God provides a preacher, God provides a gospel, God provides a church. What shall I do to be saved? Here comes this man evangelist. Now, uh, Bunyan scholars are real interesting. Bunyan wrote the story of his conversion uh, in a book that was before Pilgrim's Progress. It was, uh, let's see, what was the name of it? God's Mercy to the Children of Men or, or something like that. But it was his story. And his story is that the village evangelist was the pastor of the local Baptist church. You say, well, that's good. It's like the South. No. Baptists were very, very much a minority. They were very much a despised minority because their insistence on believers' baptism. That sure didn't fit with baptismal regeneration or by water baptism. So one thing the Anglicans and the other ones could agree with is those Baptists were pestiferous fools and that you just had to tolerate them. Well, this was a very despised bunch. He saw in his dream, though, that this evangelist, who almost certainly is a picture in Bunyan's mind of his own good and godly pastor there in Bedford, uh, graciously pointed out to him, first, this wicked gate and shining light. We'll get into that. Those are the entrances to the Christian life. Those are the drawing and, again, the, the, the beauty of the Holy Spirit. He said, I saw in my dream the man began to run. Now, he had not run from far from his own door, and his wife and children, perceiving it, began to cry out after him to return. But the man put his fingers in his ears and ran off, crying, Life, life, eternal life. Uh, and, again, if you can get Bunyan's biography and spiritual autobiography, it's tremendous. I'm sorry, I'm blanking out the name of it right there. Um, it's something like God's mercy to the chief of sinners. Uh, look in Luke 14, 26, and this is fleshed out a little bit here. If any man come to me, hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Well, this is a good illustration of that. That man in that video that pictured Bunyan himself, I didn't hate his wife and his children in the sense of just despise them or wish them ill. He hated them compared to what God was doing in his life and melting his heart and impressing him with the danger that he was in and the need to, to turn to something and be saved. So he looked not behind him, fled down the middle of the plain. In Genesis 19, 17, 
Uh, it says in a verse, it came to pass when they had brought them forth abroad, he said, escape for their life. Look not behind thee, neither stay all in the plain. Escape to the mountain, lest you be consumed. That's one of the messages that God's going to impress upon your heart. If you're a lost person and the Bible is impressing you and speaking to you, is that you need to do something. You are in danger. Jeremiah 20 and verse... 10 says, For I heard the defaming of many, fear on every side, report they say, and we'll report it. All my familiars, that is, friends and family, watched for my halting for you to stumble and fall, saying, Peradventure, he'll be enticed, we shall prevail against him, we shall take our revenge on him. So he is in danger, those he should trust, he can't. Uh, two were of. Uh, uh, were resolved to fetch him back by force. You saw one was the name Obstinate, who was a particularly irritating person, and one was named Pliable, who was a wheezing, wheedling, sort of uh, spineless person who wanted the eternal life but didn't want anything to do. You notice he had no sense of a burden. There was no burden on his back. He was just trying to, to, to get the best of both worlds. Instead of yielding to obstinate, instead of yielding to pliable, Christian begins to plead with them. He's a good evangelist even before he's saved, of to flee from the wrath to come and to come along with him. And he got for his trouble, obstinate gives him mockery and abuse. But pliable was easily persuaded to go. This would be a good uh, picture also of the four soils that the gospel goes into. Uh, some people like pliable or have a, a very quick response that doesn't last with the rising of the sun. Have you seen this before? And that's hypothetical. You have seen this before. Uh, a type of people who set out for heaven, uh, they have not the root of the matter in them and therefore they soon wither and die and turn back. Um, you probably know that verse. 1 John 2, 19, they went out from us because they were not of us. If they'd been of us, they would have doubtless remained with us, but they went out from us that it might be made manifest that they were not of us. The passage of time and the tribulations of the world will take a false profession and usually let us discover it uh, for what it is pretty quickly. There's much to notice about Pliable. And there, once you start thinking about him, there's not a big surprise that he turned out no good in the end. Pliable was ready to go out with obstinate and uh, on the errand, the evil errand of drawing Christian back to the city of destruction. When a Christian person dies at our hospital, I always tell the family, we don't want them to come back, they don't want to come back, and you don't want them to come back. You can't draw them back with a logging chain. Where they are, we'll go to or we'll never see them again. We're only going one way on this. This was Christian leaving the city of destruction for hope. And as we'll see in the next eight lessons, headed across a wicked and vile world toward the celestial city and the delectable mountains. Now that's the kind of stuff I like, and even before I know what those words mean. Uh, casting in their lot with one group and then superficially casting in with another, Pliable showed no heart, no root in the matter either way. Whatever family comes you come from, they're not going to be happy when you come to Christ. I wasn't as like a Muslim that came to Christ whose family had a funeral for me or an Orthodox Jew or those who were very, very strict. But my uh, father and mother, when I tried to tell them about Christ, about what he'd done for me and what happened, they completely misunderstood. They said, well, you know, if you hang around us, you'll, you might find that we're really not too bad a people and we, we, we're, we're pretty good people too. And I thought, oh, I don't know how to explain. I don't know what to do. Same way here. Everybody is either turning their back or trying to drag Christian back to a disaster. The only thing that tempted Pliable was the talk of an inheritance, incorruptible, undefiled, that fadeth not away. And that's part of salvation. But part of salvation, genuine salvation, is you're going to walk in a road in a world that has a lot of opposition, and that's to be expected, and it's normal for the course. And that was something in Bible who had no burden on his back and was looking for just kind of a late-night TBN-type, your best life now, was not going to have anything to do with. No, no dealing with sin, just a spiritual lottery ticket to punch along with their other schemes and plans. Listen to what Spurgeon said, the God of heaven does deep, thorough, 
radical heart work in reclaiming lost men and lost women from the kingdom of God, and he's not limited to a get out of hell free. Now, getting out of hell free is a very good thing, but it doesn't come in isolation. It comes through a whole process of God transferring your sin onto his son and also transmitting his new life into your broken old life. That's what Pliable showed no sign of whatsoever. So Pliable, without counting the cost or reckoning for a moment all the difficulties of the way, set out in a thoughtless, lighthearted manner upon a journey which always will prove too long for those who start it in their own strength. That's exactly what he did. Soon and very soon, they drew near to a very miry uh, sl slough. I think, see, we, we would say slough, like a wound that sloughs. But these Scottish guys and the commentator I heard, it was British also, he called it a slough. So that's what we'll call it. Did both suddenly fall into the bog. The name of the slough was despond. Now, I misunderstood when I came to Christ. I thought, okay, I was marked by sin in the past. I'll sin no more about a day later when I committed my usual sin uh, in my mind, I thought, I was really stunned. I thought, I thought I'm a new person. How can this happen? Same way here. The first thing that comes up, Pliable is out of there. He says, well, forget this. Two pilgrims in a slough. Bunyan says here, therefore they wallowed for a time, being grievously bedaubed with dirt and Christian because of the burden that was on his back began to sink in the mire. Now this is very sad, but we find out when we read the book that it wasn't quite as bad as they'd made it. Pliable was uh, furious at the fact of the opposition and the, and the slough they fell in. Christian was in bad shape because of a large burden on his back and his feet had no direction. But we find out later that but had they known where to look, they might have discovered that there were by the direction of the lawgiver, certain good and substantial steps placed even with their very midst of this slough. They had hardly placed their feet upon these steps. Uh, in other words, their trust was in the goodness and the promises of God. These steps were promises. We've talked about this before. If a young man or a young woman comes to Christ and they've lived for the devil like all of us did our entire life till then, they're, they're not going to be encouraged and assured primarily by their own behavior, even though it is going to change. It hasn't changed very much the first day or two. They've got to be completely encouraged by the truth of God's word. And, and what they have to do is like the man that was uh, whispered into his ear on the way home from a meeting, you didn't get saved. You're still the same worthless person you always were. We all know about you and knew, you know about you. And if those people down at the meeting knew about you, they wouldn't eat lunch with you. They wouldn't join a club that you were a member of. They wouldn't have anything to do with you. And he sweated and he moaned and he took his Bible and finally he took John 5, 24 and it says, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life shall not pass into condemnation but is passed from death to life. And he took the book and he held it up to the devil and said, read it yourself, read it yourself. You know what? That's an external objective source of truth that you can bring to play. When you feel one thing and God's word says another that you should automatically and joyfully and to your credit default to the truth of God's word. Uh, feelings come and feelings go and feelings on deceiving there's not except the word of God that is worth believing. That's exactly true. Uh, notice the early exit of Pliable. At this, Pliable began to be offended and angrily said to his fellow, is this the happiness you told me of? If we have such ill speed at our first setting out, what may we expect between this and our journey's end? May I get out again with my life? You shall possess the brave country alone. You talk about dripping with sarcasm. Uh, and possessed a brave country alone for me. With that, Pliable gave a desperate struggle or two and he got out of his mire on that side of the slough which was next to his own house. So he went away, Christian saw him no more and will see him no more either. Now this is common, no great outward trial, a promising start, a sudden damper, pales the flesh of early joy and some who set out on the road to heaven turn back and so prove that they did not start out aright or by God's call or empowerment had never 
had the work of God, the Holy Spirit, truly in their souls. Don't forget that sec 1 John 2, 19. That's a critical verse. Do you have friends like this? Worse yet, I won't look at anybody because I don't want you to think that I'm thinking about that. Could this be any of you? You say, I've been a member here. So I'm glad you have, and I don't see anybody that I would think about that. But understand, this is absolutely possible. You may have been invited, and then you may have been attending services and singing good music and a fine Bible study, studying, learning a lot and getting warm and excited, enthusiastic, but it all fades, and early excitement is forgotten as they return to the fold of the world. Uh, here's what Spurgeon said. May God grant that we may not, may not have any pliables in our church. But guess what? Every church has some. Uh, that's the idea. But, of course, we do get them sometimes, and sometimes they go a great deal further on the Pilgrim's Road than Mr. Bunyan describes. Now, that's not kind of sad that there was help, but they didn't know about it. There were steps that were the promise of God that they could have claimed fully authoritative. They didn't do it. After this, two pilgrims in the slough, do you remember that man help? He looked good. He looked like somebody that worked at Lowe's or Home Depot or something. He had that good beard, big forearms, looked like he was ready to go to work for us. You know, they used to have the little buttons, and there's not very many buttons anymore at Lowe's. They, it seemed like they took a bunch of them out. But it was the help button. And here comes, you know, your own uh, Christian worker or, or a deacon or, of course, a pastor or somebody that's come to help you. Christian, by reason of his burden, had a harder time, and he would have failed, but a man came to him whose name was Help and asked him what he was about. Christian said, Sir, I was bid go this way by a man called Evangelist who directed me to yonder gate that I might escape the wrath to come, and as I was going, he's implying, I was doing what they told me, I fell in. Help said, But why did you not look for the steps? He didn't know about the steps. Fear followed me so hard, said Christian, that I fled the next way and fell. Uh, and then he said, give me thy hand. And so he gave him his hand and he drew him out and set him upon sound ground and bid him go his way. There's a verse that is uh, about God taking care of us in miry clay. It's uh, Psalm 40, verse 2. Uh, I think you know this verse. It says... Uh, Gosh, I hope I do because I forgot to write it down. But anyway, it says, He brought me up also out of an horrible pit and set my feet upon a rock and established my goings and put a new song in my house, even in my mouth, even praise unto our God. Many shall see it in fear and trust in the Lord our God. Now, that, I call that verse Don Steele's verse. He was a drug rep 30 years ago that came to my office who was a wonderful Christian, a real encourager. And he told me the wildest story about God's helping him being hit the basis of his evangelism. He said, I always wanted to try to talk to people at all these doctor's offices that I went to, but I was there on business and they were there and just seemed an impenetrable wall. And he said, I thought, I'll just pray, God, you help me to give me anything to happen to me that could open these doors where I could witness to people. And God says, do you mean it? He says, sure. He says, okay. <laughs> so a week later, he comes down with prostate cancer and it's advanced pretty far. He said, all of a sudden, the people that couldn't talk to me about salvation are nice human beings. They talk to me about my cancer. And they talk to me, well, how do you handle this? How are you able to look forward? What if you die? He said, it was the most open door I've ever had, and it was the end of Psalm 40. Many shall see it in fear and trust in the Lord our God. And what did they see it in fear? He brought me up also out of a miry pit and set my feet upon a rock and established my going. That's exactly what early Christians can say, you had troubles at the beginning of your Christian life. I did too. You just don't understand anything. Without a vision, the people perish. Understanding is just very hard to get to when you're not raised in any kind of Christian environment. The Spirit of God gives the church and gifts the church with, and this is good, the apostles, prophets, teachers, and in days gone by with miracles and gifts of healing. But guess what? Helps. The help that we saw there, trying to get him out of that early slough of despond, was almost certainly a good, solid Christian worker or neighbor or friend. He probably was not an apostle. He was not a prophet, a teacher, a miracle worker, anything like that. Listen to the people that do the most good in the most common situations, which is you and me. This was a great, this is about helps. 
This was a great company of irregular folks, not fitting neatly into outward categories as those mentioned before, a useful body of people, worthy to be mentioned in the same list as apostles, prophets, and teachers, perhaps no official standing, but only moved by the natural impulse of divine life which was in them to do anything and everything which would assist either the teacher, the pastor, the deacon in the work of the Lord. That's good. I have no ability uh, in a 15 or 20 minute visit at my office, and plus Blue Cross is paying me not to talk about Bible, but talk about them. But it, it's an opportunity to be a help. Put that in your house, in your neighborhood, in your home, in your people like that. No official capacity. Augustine was saved by hearing women on the other side of a fence gossip the gospel. That is, they were just talking as naturally about the gospel as they would the events of the day. Same way with, uh, who else am I thinking of? Oh, there's another one. But anyway, Augustine's the most famous. Careful imitation of the man whose name was help, as described by Bunyan, is recommended. This is what you and I can do at Weigel's. I love Weigel's. And your food city. And, uh, and they're moving soon, right down you know, near us here. And... Um, all the different places that we go, uh, Home Depot and Lowe's, we can talk to people. When you meet somebody who is in despair, watch what, watch what helps does. This is a very wise thing. You get him to state his own case. Help did not immediately reach out a hand to Christian. He didn't say, what are you doing? Why haven't you looked for the steps? That, he said, that's what he said. What are you doing? Why haven't you looked for the steps? You find out what's going on in their heart. It does men much good to have them unveil their spiritual gifts and griefs to comforters. The answers will direct the line of help for that person. Not only do you get him to state his own case, you patiently listen to his concern. They told us in the physical diagnosis class that in that 15 minutes you have for a visit, if you will just be quiet and let the patient talk at about minute eight, nine, or 11, they will tell you what's wrong with them. They, have, they know themselves better than you do. They may not be describing it in a way, but after a while, it, the light will come on in your eyes that they will actually tell you if you'll just be quiet and listen and give them your full attention and your eyes to their eyes. That will connect with them. Not only get him to state his own case and patiently listen to his concern, but stoop down to help. Don't miss this important point. Somebody said nobody cares how much you know until they know how much you care. That's exactly right. There's a priority in this and an order. If you go in there blowing smoke and you're the greatest thing since sliced bread, nobody wants to be around you. Pride stinks. Pride goeth before fall, haughty spirit before destruction, and it just stinks up the room. It's no good. Uh, Sympathy is the mainspring of our ability to help others. You, that's what he did. He didn't say, why, you idiot, you deserve to drown. I'll come back later and see if you're alive. Don't sneer at small problems. There are no small problems. So, let me give you a medical definition. You know what a serious illness is? Anything that happens to me. Anything is very serious. Well, I assume it's true for you, too. Whatever you got is very serious. It is true. Don't sneer at small problems. Don't scold at foolish problems. If you find a brother in the mire, put your arms right down in the mud. By God's grace, you may lift him out. You say, but wasn't he very foolish to get in? Well, haven't you been very foolish in your life? What a silly thing to say. Don't say that. By God's grace, you may lift him out. Yes, they were very foolish, but so were we and so are we often. And like Paul, at least we become fools for their sake. How do you comfort? Well, you stand on firm ground when you comfort with the promises of God. Remember, those were the steps in the slough. Uh, and it's a picture of us giving firm, good comfort. Christians missed, or Christian missed the solid stepping stones because of fear. We should point sinking souls to solid. I've had that happen a million times. People say, I just can't believe about this and this and this about salvation. And I'll say, what is it about the nature of God and the character of Christ and the work that he did that you don't trust? He said, oh, I trust all those. I said, well, what do you not trust? He said, well, how I feel about it. I said, well, who cares what you feel about it? It has nothing to do with it. Let's go back to some solid stepping stones. The great heart of God, the, the deep work of Christ, 
the, the a different heart he's given those around you to love you and intercede for you. What do you doubt about that? What is not going on there that is obviously from God? We should point sinking soul to the solid, precious promises of God's word, and that's why we need to have them armed and ready at our fingertips and in the tip of our tongue as a valiant man at your right hand. Hide God's word in your heart and be ready for an answer for the, to give an answer for the hope that's in you with meekness and fear because you want to be a help. And you want to shift the conversation from, I drove up in my truck and got a logging chain to pull you out of this thing, to God directed us here. And here's some, here is some good, fat, firm foundations that will make all the difference in your world. They've made them in ours. A word spoken in good season, how good it is. The Bible says, as cold waters to a thirsty soul, so is good news from a far country. That's, that verse means everything to me. I think about that all the time. Now here's a quote from Spurgeon. Some texts in the Bible are like those constellations in the heaven that are so conspicuous that when the mariner once sees them, he knows in what direction he is steering. Certain brilliant passages of scripture appear to be set in the firmament of revelation as guiding stars to bewildered souls. Quote them often. Rivet the sinner's eye upon them. Thus shall you aid him most efficiently. Boy, that is strong stern stuff that's 16 ounces to the pound after quoting that promise try to instruct those who need your help more fully in the plan of salvation you say well they've got a a pastor and they have a teacher well work with them i mean obviously they're, they're not satisfied because they're dragging around maybe you even though your knowledge is not as much as a pastor or the teacher or something that but you but you have a heart for this person and they know it you have a door that's open that that we don't have. That's the idea. The preacher or the teacher may try, but you who live and walk with somebody have a door that is much more effectual and much more likely to be because you can be a help. That's the idea. Uh, that's great. Um, do point them to the Savior. Don't trouble. You know, in Star Wars it said, you don't need to look at these passports. You know, they just kind of Jedi mind tricks. When they say, well, what about... Women deacons, and what about this and that? You just go, you know, we'll talk about all that. that what if that's a very, very low priority thing to talk about. Something controversial they want to argue about. Just say no. Uh, you know, people have fussed at Bunyan for having pointed Christian to a wicked gate, evangelist to uh, point to Christian to a wicked gate or a bright light instead of straight on to Christ. There's a reason for that. This is... This is what Bunyan's life was like. He had to be pointed in his mind at least from darkness to light and at least from answers from the world to answers from the church. And he did finally come to Christ. And when he did, the burden rolled off his back. And it's, it's a very exciting thing. Do point them to the Savior. Now, this is great. You say, I don't know what to say. Here's what you can say. When you don't know what to say, give your testimony and make you very small, which should not be very hard, and make Jesus very, very big. My goodness, we, had, we went to the Bible conference down in Jacksonville one time and they had a meeting about somebody had a ministry to Muslims and he wanted to know, well, when they say, how could God have a son? And this verse in the Quran says that, what do you do? He says, you just don't talk anything about that. You say, I've met Jesus and he changed my life. Do you want to hear about it? Everybody would say, yes, absolutely we do. Uh, that's what people want, and that's what's going on here. What a relief to hear others have felt as you and I have. We've all been along the same road. It's a great means of grace to tell others what they are going through, you have gone through, and what you've gone through, they're likely to see. Uh, that's the idea. Are you an elder brethren in the body? Then here's a vital message for you. You know what we like to do? You get a few gray hairs in your head, and you like to fuss and blame young people for not knowing things they've never had any time to learn about. They, it's not that they've rejected these truths. They've never heard them. They kind of were hoping you'd tell them. So quit fussing and quit looking down and, and talk about your experience, not only in salvation, but in walking with the Lord. And, and be, that help, this is a real focus here. Don't fuss at people because they don't have a, a young heads on old shoulders. That's the idea. Pray with the pilgrim. Now, now this is spiritual depth. I never heard this in my life. Spurgeon says, if you can't tell the sinner all that you want to tell, pray with him, talk to God in his presence, and know that not only is God hearing you, but he is probably closing that circuit and talking to this man in his 
name, in his language, and in his life. That's perfect. Tell it to God in the sinner's presence. This can be very plain and very useful. Pray for and with and regarding all who come to you in need for help. And you'd be like that man. I didn't hear the bell ring. That's good. Conclusion. We're out of time. The material is too much and too rich. Mr. Worldly Wise Man points Christian to the wrong path, the way of legality. You say, I just don't think I need to trust somebody else to get me to heaven. You do. I'll tell you that to begin with. But when you say, I'll just earn my way to heaven, you're foolish of two things. One is the, uh, is the use of the law unto salvation. The use of the law unto salvation is to show you you need to be saved. It is a mirror that shows you your wickedness, and it is a schoolmaster that leads you to Christ. It has no role in salvation as far as an action of salvation. Romans 3.20 says, Therefore, by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is salvation in, in, in being good. No, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. That's good. You can't make a good therapeutic choice and treatment until you make a good diagnosis. Well, the law is an excellent diagnostician. Oh, there's another one. You're no good. <laughs> That's a great diagnosis because it's true. Titus 3, 5, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration, by the renewing of the Holy Ghost. That's pretty clear. And then finally, the one that we've learned in our scripture memory is Ephesians 8 through 10. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourself. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works that God has before ordained that we should walk therein. So when the Christian approaches the law, it's not like the bare law of Moses, and you could never pass it. It is no uh, thunders and lightnings and threats and terrors. That's no safe place. Uh, and it's designed to convict and condemn people and have them turn and go to Christ. Evangelists had to then and has to now speak sharply to those who turn and trust in their own righteousness, their own ability to keep the law, and uh, their own attempt to impress God. Next week, we're going to go to church together to what Bunyan calls the interpreter's house. And it will change the way you think about church, and he's exactly right. So we'll do this each week. We'll do our video and, and do these lessons. And, and I would encourage you to get the book because I am i can't give you the sense of this a tenth of what Bunyan could himself. Or you take uh, Bunyan above us and then Spurgeon up there with Bunyan. You're getting into pretty tall cotton there. This is going to be a very good series because we've got some spiritual giants like Spurgeon and Bunyan that are going to help us to understand. Father, thanks for today and these good lessons and help us to learn. And help us to apply it in our lives and, our, and help us to be a help wherever we spend most of our time each day. Amen. <laughs>